and the U.S. control Japan. 중국의 강력한 경제적 불에 우리가 끌려 들어가지 않을 수 없는. That's why we're trying to do this. It's it's not in their interest. Japan, America, China wants to see a unified Korea. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the Chungang Ilbo CSI's Forum 2015. Please give Dr. Hong Sak Hyun a big round of applause. Thank you for coming to the Chungang Ilbo CSI's Forum 2015. We are in the midst of a major transformation, which is fueling global anxiety to a palpable level. From the geopolitical standpoint, it has become evident over the last 70 years since the Second World War that no one nation can go it alone now. It is time to map out next 70 years. In order to alleviate the pain and suffering that comes with this unprecedented turmoil, it goes without saying that we need the right policies and leadership. And speaking of leadership, it strikes me that the age of unipolar leadership or hegemony appears to be over. I'm sure you will agree that a major factor will be relations between the United States and China. The two countries are in competition in both the foreign affairs and economic arenas with China demonstrating an increasing assertiveness in opposition to the American-led international order. I may sound like an idealist, but if we are bold and creative enough to forge a resolution to North Korea's nuclear issue, if the U.S. pivot to Asia hits a true balance, if China does not pursue a Sinocentric hegemony to arbitrarily replace the existing order, and if Japan stops this revisionist push to deny and rewrite history, let me dare say the next 70 years will be headed in the right direction. The big question is how. That is why I believe each and every one of us are here today. We have gathered once again in Seoul, not simply for the sake of being here, but to make the most of the opportunity to pull and share what we know and what we have learned for the sake of peace in Asia in the decades to come. Thank you. My President Park Geun-hye has become very famous by coining the term Asian paradox. What did you take on Asian paradox? The first problem of our security and peace and prosperity is firstly North Korea. And secondly, I think what we usually call the Abenesia, Abe's amnesia of history. <laughs> the more important thing than that is what, how we see Japan how we Koreans see Japan and how Americans see Japan. We think Japan can become a liability for the peace and stability in this region because of this past track record. But the United States takes Japan as an asset. And then at the same time, the more impo uh, similarly important thing is the rising Chinese Sino-centrism. Uh, this issue of history and in particular of comfort women and this is a sensitive and important issue I think on that issue uh, Japan's alone I think any effort by Tokyo to try to explain or, or somehow parse what happened will utterly fail on the other hand um, 
I think Korea's view of Japan is dissonant with the rest of the world, uh, with the one exception of China. In the U.S. and public opinion polls uh, recently, um, Japan was ranked the fourth most trustworthy country in the world. Um, that number actually went down a little bit in the previous Japanese DPJ government. It's now at an all-time high under Abe. But it's not just the U.S. In Southeast Asia, in polls last year, 96% of respondents in 10 ASEAN countries said they trust Japan. In South Asia, it's about 90%. In Australia, it's highest ever. So the Korean um, description of Japan as a source of instability is completely dissonant and odd for almost every other uh, country in this region, with the exception of China, and I suppose North Korea. South Korea is abnormal and Japanese normal. Do you agree with you know, Professor Green's observation? I think we have to have a kind of uh, the objective evaluation of what Abe is trying to do and what, he, what, he, what he's doing. He's very quite active in the strategy in dealing with uh, the global diplomatic affairs and the regional affairs. But one, one thing that is missing is uh, Asian diplomacy. He, he's not dealing with Japan, the Korea, and China in a proper way because of his conviction about his uh, ideological, ideological conviction about the past. Kind of a glorifying and denying and distorting the past is causing some problems between us. Uh, but uh, but uh, in the, I, I don't want to blame uh, the Japan, Abe as Japan only. Between 1997 and uh, for about 10 years until 2008, it was a multilateral moment. We had the, we had the, they constructed the very multilateral mechanisms for cooperation, and it, it seemed as if it's going well. But from around the, uh, 2010 and 2012, we got into the negative spiral of uh, the uh, fighting each other, blaming each other. This is happening in the context of a rising China, rising and assertive China. They are trying to gradually modify the regional order. I don't think China is trying to challenge the United States. And Japan is extremely proactively defensive and thinking China as an almost a kind of a challenge to the Japan dominated the order in, the, in East Asia. We want to have a, the very good relationship with China while developing a very strengthened allies to the United States. What is missing in the Korean diplomacy is uh, how to deal with the obvious Japan is missing at the same time. We are somewhat concerned about Japan's play in the game. It increases more chance of arms race so from Korea's point of view, whenever there, is, there was an arms race in history in this region, we fell the first victim. So that is the point why we are concerned about Japan. I think it is not just Abe personally. Abe was elected by Japanese people. Is a strengthened Japan-US alliance. Is a blessing for us or a curse for us or in between? At least it's not a curse. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget that uh, Korea is the ally to the United States. And then uh, for the defense of Korea, South Korea, from uh, potential North Korean attack, we need the support from the United States and Japan. We have to, use, to utilize a seven United Nations bases in Japan. Without them, we cannot effectively de 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 deter against uh, North Korean attack. In that sense, strengthening U.S.-Japan alliance is not against Korean interest. But the problem is that, as you, you ask the question about whether Japan is normal or abnormal, I think most of aspects of Japan is normal. But uh, there is a one aspect that is abnormal in obvious diplomacy. That's a history issue. That's too much. I think uh, he's trying to glorify the, the past and to try to deny kind of some, uh, the forceful mobilization of the comfort women and focusing only about the physical enforcement was there or not. This is a kind of minor element, but it's sticking to the issues. Uh, he's a, he visited Yasukuni Shrine, and he's, even though he's abstaining from Yasukuni Shrine visit at this moment, he's allowing his cabinet members to go to the Yasukuni Shrine. Is he really serious about uh, taking the history in a, in a proper way or not? So that's the, I don't think that's a kind of uh, asset for Abe. I think that's a li liability for Abe. I don't think uh, any of your American friends have uh, any doubts about the depth of the feelings in Korea about history, uh, and we understand how raw the emotions are. Uh, uh, so be assured of that, please. But on the question of arms race, yeah, an arms race began in Asia, not just Northeast Asia, Asia, because of the fear of China, not a fear of Japan, uh, China. 
is uh, the reason that people are uh, purchasing arms to such a high degree. Can the U.S. control Japan for its unruly behavior? The reality is we've never really been able to control Japan as a sovereign country. Uh, Japan's defense budget was flat or declining for well over a decade, and Mr. Abe has increased it to about 2% a year. Korea's defense budget is increasing 4% a year, should be more. Um, China's defense budget, the official figures are 15% or so a year for the last two decades. Um, so, you know, there is an arms race and it's, it's, it's coming from China. Of course, we know the distinction between remilitarization of Japan and the revival of old 1930s militarism in Japan. But what we worry about is, given the particular situational logic in Japan, the American tolerance of Japanese military strengthening could bring about very negative consequences, not only for arms race in the region, but actual fear coming from Korea, China, even Southeast Asian countries. What is your take on that issue? Um, Southeast Asian countries aren't afraid. They're actually um, asking to buy uh, patrol boats and equipment from Japan. Japan faces a challenge from the rise of China. The, the, the Chinese are using coercive pressure. <clears throat> and then Japan now is targeted by um, probably 300 North Korean missiles, at least chemical nuclear weapons, which they weren't um, a decade or more ago. So I think it's worth asking, what path is better? Is it better for the U.S. to say to Japan, you're on your own? You don't militarize, and you're on your own. In which case, the Japanese uh, government, any government, would be more likely to <clears throat> militarize on its own. Or is it better to have, take a path where the U.S. says, we reaffirm our commitment, we reaffirm our commitment to the security of uh, the area in the east, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Senkaku area under Article 5. We reaffirm our nuclear umbrella. We reaffirm our commitment and defense guidelines. We want to um, uh, work together more closely, and Japan has agreed to change its inter constitutional interpretation due to do that, and, and therefore we're together. And if you ask really which is in Korea's interests, or Japan's or the U.S. interests, I think the path that we that Republican and Democratic administrations have chosen. The second path is, is better. Should we join the, the MD or not? No. Well, at this moment, if we are going to join the, deep, uh, the uh, it have this thought system, then this art system should be proved to be very useful, useful in depending missiles coming from North Korea. If that is the case, I don't think China can oppose. I don't think Chinese officials come to Seoul and say no to this. How could they say that? no? But if not? If not, we cannot. How can? If not, if it's not technically and militarily proved, how, why do we, why do we deploy this kind of very expensive and very provocative and disruptive system? The area where North Korea is, you know, exponentially increasing their capability is in um, ballistic missiles and then, of course, uh, their nuclear program. Um, so, so the Republic of Korea is much more threatened by North Korean ballistic missiles today than it was five years ago or ten years ago. THAAD would um, provide protection. Um, THAAD would not do anything to Chinese missiles. As John Hamry has pointed out, there's public um, uh, records showing that Chinese have moved their long-range missiles back um, and uh, already. So THAAD wouldn't affect the Chinese ballistic missiles. It is not in any way a military threat to China and in no way undermines China's deterrent. I think the reason Beijing doesn't like THAAD is because China's view is, over time, U.S. alliances, beginning with Korea in the Chinese view, in Asia will start to wither and weaken. And THAAD and integration of missile defense to the Chinese represents a strengthening of alliances. Um, and they don't want that. And your comments, uh, Minister, were very reasonable. If uh, it's shown, if that is shown to protect Korea, there's, China has no right to tell you what to do and how to protect yourself. But we've not mentioned one aspect of that. It might be that it defends the United States from ballistic missiles from North Korea. And if that's the case, it would seem to me the Republic of Korea should at least look at it. I didn't say to do it, but you ought to look at it, because if we were hit, if the ballistic missiles from North Korea can hit the United States, as some people are saying, uh, and we were attacked, and this would just really raise questions about our alliance. If we, our premise is that uh, this is to defend the United States from uh, the North Korean uh, missile attack, then we have to set the premise in that way. Korea and the United States are allies. We are, 
militarily helping each other for our mutual safety. So in case there is a threat coming from Korean Peninsula or somewhere else to the United States, if we, we can join and help you, you, I think we have to do that. But if that is the case, we have to set condition on that aspect, saying that, okay, there is a missile threat from North Korea, probably attacking the United States, so we are allies of the United States, we are going to help, and then so we want to set up here the ANTPY2 the radar system, and some other preventive uh, equipment here. That would be focus of the, should be focus of the debate. Now, the focus of the debate is that with this system, we can defend ourselves from incoming missiles from North Korea to South Korea. So premise itself is not correct. That is the point, what I'm saying. Particularly since 9-11, the United States has a mentality of be with us or against us. That kind of mentality makes a country like Korea very much uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Our position is we like to be with you. And also, we like to be with China. But at last, we like to be more with you than the others. So this kind of difference should be accommodated uh, by the United States. Isn't it be OK for us to maintain status quo instead of trying to change? Okay. And would it be possible? And would it be a possible way to manage the Asian paradox? That's a question to you. Uh, I don't think. Uh that anything remains uh, as a status quo. As Bob Jung said, the U.S. is certainly not a status quo nation. So, no, it's not possible to be a status quo. We've expressed views here this morning about uh, being more of a global power uh, in Korea, one which we would certainly support. The United States, we see ourselves right now uh, just like China in a way. China's re-rising. We're re-rising out of the recession. So uh, if you were to maintain the status quo, you'd be left behind. It won't work. And it won't work because everyone else is changing, including Japan, trying to change. Whether they're successful or not, it's still a Then what should an open we question. do? We should the South Korea should join the United States in balancing against the Chinese rights? Not, not at all. I was I would have answered the question on uh, Vice President Biden's remark by saying it's a it was a bad choice of words. Uh, it's not choose us or choose them or with us or with them. Uh, certainly, Korea can uh, maintain a good relationship and alliance with. United States and have a good relationship, certainly economic, with China, and they ought to do that. Can the U.S. go in tandem with China, the way you described today? You are portraying China as a potential threat to the region. As I say, we we don't find necessarily today that China is our enemy. Uh, if we fail in diplomacy, then China could become our enemy. I don't think we'll fail. Uh, because both of us have so much interest in, in the international system. Uh, but to go in tandem with China, a country which is auto autocratic, uh, doesn't share our values, uh, uh, etc., is, is probably not in the cards. But to be able to cooperate where we both agree on things, and it's in the interest of not only our countries but of the region, sure. Uh, we do that to a small extent with infectious diseases and things of that nature. China says things to the United States like, don't worry, the Pacific is plenty big enough for both of us. But there are real questions as what they mean by that. Does that mean that from Guam East is the area of interest to the United States and Guam West is that of, of, of China? And these are questions that all our friends in Asia ask. So I don't think it's going to quite be a kumbaya moment, but uh, we'll, we'll make it through with, with China. Okay, Park Sal hee if you are national security advisor to president, what kind of choice would you make? First principle to decide every issue we are talking about should be a Korean strategic interest rather than anything else. And then we should not be perceived as a potential swing state, that the swing between the United States and other countries. So we should not go against the American interest, but we, we, can, we can resolve the issue. The first, we have to, the, the source of the threat should be clear. It's not China. It's not uh, Japan or United States. It's North Korea. So we should be prepared for any kind of uh, potential threat from North Korea, including missiles and others. China is playing 
great power diplomacy. Japan is trying to become a, a great power, trying to exercise great power diplomacy rather than middle power diplomacy. So the, the, the rivalry between the two countries are really concerns us. That's the reason why we are talking about this Asian paradox. And here, the role of Korea is absolutely important uh, because we don't have any debt or burden. We don't have a history burden at all. We are a democratic country. We, have, we don't have any system, system burden. We are relatively affluent. So we don't have economic burden. So, so, and uh, we, we, we are not an isolated nation like North Korea. So we, have, we, have, we, have, we can go global. So in that sense, I think Korea should play a very active and proactive role to facilitate cooperation, mediate, and bridge, bridge all the conflicts uh, the, uh, among the nations. That's the, that's the thing the, that the Korea can play in order to achieve this, uh, the Asian paradox. In the world, become so familiar to everyone here in Korea is this concept of unification as a, a bonanza or a jackpot adopted by in the Park Geun-hye administration. But I think it represents an evolution of thinking uh, here in Korea but as well as in the international community about unification. The main driver is what's happening in North Korea. There's a lot of uncertainty in the North and that much as we might wish and hope that unification could be pushed off for generations into the future, the reality of the situation might be it could fall into our laps tomorrow or uh, a week from now or a month from now or a year from now and, and therefore we need to be prepared for it, we need to think about it. My point here is I don't think the change is so much ideological as much as it is pragmatic uh, and a response to concerns about what's happening in North Korea. Um, and I just feel like there's going to be something that will happen in inter-Korean relations. Something, some major event is going to happen in inter-Korean relations, I feel like, before the end of President Park's term in office, largely because it's been pretty dormant thus far. And, and I just feel like something's going to happen, and that may be the next big uh, shock in this whole process. As we all know, the North Korean problem particularly in the nuclearization issue and uh, some human rights issue is uh, becoming um, very uh, hard and difficult and serious. Some um, surveys show that uh, most Korean people are worried about the North Korean um, uh, possible uh, attack to the South Korea. And uh, uh, North Korea's internal anxiety caused by some economic inefficiency and uh, some humanitarian issues has already become um, the big problems uh, in, in South Korea as well as in the world. Uh, even world, I think very important thing is the South Korean's attitude toward North Korea is uh, sharply changing. Last year, according to our survey, uh, North Korea was identified as the most dangerous country to South Korean people and the, about 80% of population concerned about the future uh, possible some, um, conflicts or tensions between two Koreans. So in that sense, I think uh, uh, we need to think about the peace 
uh, more seriously than before. Uh, since Kim Jong-un officially took power in 2012, I guess, uh, I believe economic performance of the leadership has been quite impressive, uh, not uh, bad at all. Uh, the economists, for instance, predicted uh, a uh, economic uh, growth rate a figure of 7.5% for this year, which is quite uh, impressive given the fact that uh, in the last uh, decade, North Korea grew only around by 1%. I uh, believe that in the agricultural sector, what they call May 30 measures, uh, the, the government has uh, proclaimed a uh, measure May last year, uh, which was designed to uh, make the family as the basic level of agricultural production and also other uh, incentive measures designed to promote the market activities in North Korea. And also, uh, more importantly, perhaps, uh, this economic performance by North Korea this year uh, may be uh, suggestive of the future direction that the uh, North Korean economy is going to be headed. I believe uh, Kim Jong-un is different from his grandfather and his father. Uh, Kim Jong-un went to school in Europe, in Switzerland, for uh, some said uh, seven years, uh, in his tender uh, years. And uh, he saw uh, in Europe uh, how the Western uh, system uh, was working. So I do believe China can be modeled for uh, North Korean leadership. Uh, 25 years ago, and I remember my, my mentors and colleagues who were training me saying, you know, you, you got to understand about China North Korea. This is not the lips and teeth alliance that it once was. This is a very strained relationship underneath. There's a great debate in China as to whether or not the cost benefit of this relationship really works in their advantage anymore. They're seeing North Korea more as an albatross than as a as a um, advantage and so on and so forth. And I start with that because that conversation happened for me 25 years ago, but it could have happened last week. It could have happened yesterday. I remember um, a recent visit with my business partner, Rich Armitage, meeting with a very senior Chinese official. And uh, it occurred to us after the meeting, you know, he couldn't even bring himself to say the name. He would only say that young boy in Pyongyang, that young man. And so clearly there's a lot of uh, frustration and annoyance. But the question is, is there any sort of tipping point or any trigger or any threshold that North Korea could uh, pass or anything that could change the, the Chinese calculus on this so that they might change their approach? Because I think their current approach is basically to sustain the status quo, which means they would be an inhibitor uh, or, or at least not a help to unification. So this, this is not a good trajectory, and, and I expect what we'll see is more of the same. I think they will continue their support for North Korea at, at sort of a subsist subsistence level, uh, keep the regime on life support. Um, they certainly were willing to do that after the sinking of the Chonan and the Human Rights Report and, and so on. The six-party talks are very important to China. It's something that they have some control over and that they act as host and, and uh, intermediary of, of sorts. It also, for them, I think, is a mechanism to buy some time and, and um, uh, exert influence in, in ways that don't require them to uh, put more pressure or, or, or coercive pressure on. If North Korea con conducts uh, another uh, nuclear test, do you think uh, China is still maintaining the same position? It's not at all clear to me that a fourth nuclear test is so much worse than a third nuclear test that it, that it somehow crosses a threshold that China can no longer bear, or, or even the sort of combination. Do we have to tighten up uh, economic sanctions on North Korea, or we have to uh, explore kind of a, a dialogue with North Korea? Well, I don't think we have to tighten up uh, sanction on North Korea anymore. It's been under sanction uh, serious enough uh, to have suffered uh, in economic uh, activities. You see. We had a conference at CSIS where we looked at sanctions that have been placed on Iran and compared them with sanctions against North Korea. 
and the sanctions against Iran are much. Yeah, that, yeah, that was our conference. Yeah, <laughs> the sanctions against Iran were much, much bigger in scope and in breadth, and so there still is a lot that can be done there, and it's still, I think, an important tool. Kim Jong Un need to realize that uh, there is the third way, rather than choosing either regime collapse or status quo. It would be good to help North Korea to accept the change without concerning for regime collapse. Uh, there is some good sign from North Korea. Surveys show that there are some significant changes in North Korea. Last year, uh, more than 80% responded that individual interest is considered more important than group interest or uh, national interest. 68% responded and said that they had experienced using some kind of items from South Korea. Even though it's not so big, but we need to use uh, their possibilities to promote North Korea's internationalization or normalization, their relations with outside world. But at least I can say we have a rigid uh, three kind of a tentative conclusions. First, uh, we have to be pragmatic uh, rather than driven by very rigorous uh, ideology. Second, we have to prepare. Uh, for peaceful unification as well as for kind of a sudden change uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Lastly, uh, we have to get China on board, uh, even though uh, we are not quite happy with uh, Chinese behavior in dealing with a variety of uh, North Korea-related issues. It seems to me that what's happened since the end of the Cold War uh, is that the West, the United States, and others have hoped to expand this liberal international order to encompass the in entire world and to incorporate within it systems that weren't yet liberal democracies, uh, and the system is under strain. It's being tested in various ways, primarily by illiberal states, especially the larger ones, particularly Russia and China. I think the liberal international order has been the most important thing in the world, and it's not the only thing in the world. The question is, China will be the most important thing in the world, or will it be the most important thing in the world, or will it be the most important thing in the world? I think it's the most important thing in the world. The post-war period, in the sense of the most important thing, 상당히 유니파이드 월드 오더였는데 그런데 이제는 미국의 이니셔티브에 의해서 주도됐던 그 시큐리티 이니셔티브들이 상당히 그에 근거한 인터내셔널 콜라보레이션이 상당히 어려워진 것이 아닌가 지난 70년간 우리 한국의 경우는 미국이 우리를 어, 프로텍트 했을 뿐만 아니라 한미동맹 덕분에 한국은 최소의 비용으로 어, 최대의 국가 이익을 어, 향유할 수 있었다 그런데 지금 가장 심각한 한국의 문제점은 뭐냐 많은 사람들이 지적하고 있지만 은 시큐리티는 미국에 의존하면서 경제적 문제는 중국과 아, 말하자면 이 관계가 더 심화되고 있는 현실 이것이 바로 어, 한미동맹의 상당히 심각한 딜레마를 초래하고 있는 것이 아니냐 여러 사람들이 지적하고 있는 것이 되겠습니다 그런데 난 미국 프렌드 우리 참여자들에게 질문하고 싶은 것이 자꾸 일본이나 미국에서 우리가 중국에 경사된다고 자꾸 걱정을 하는데 중국이 우리를 끌어들인다기보다 중국의 강력한 풀, 견인력에 우리가 어떻게 안 끌려 들어갈 수 있느냐, 어떻게 리지스트 할수 있느냐, 그걸 좀 얘기해 줬으면 좋겠다. 중국의 거대한 경제력, 그게 우리가 어떻게 안 끌려 들어갈 수 있느냐, 리지스트 할수 있는 방법이 뭐냐. 그래서 지금 이제 우리나라에서 굉장히 그 논의가 블랙 앤드 화이트의 초이스의 논의가 많습니다. 중국에 붙을 거냐, 미국에 
에, 붙을 거냐 뭐 이런 그 아주 단색적인 에, 논의들이 많은데 에, 한국이 지금 당면한 문제는 그동안 미국 중심의 미, 한미동맹의 모든 것을 의지해 왔는데 이제는 상당히 그이 중국의 등장에 따라서 우리가 이 다른 나라들과도 이 멀티플 플렉스블 파트너십을 구축하지 않으면 안 되는 상황에 와 있다. I believe the current situation facing Korean Peninsula in the name of international liberal order has been some anachronic and that does not work anymore in terms of a previous standard view regarding international liberal order because traditional trilateral tie among Republic of Korea, Japan, United States uh, do not seem to work very well. And traditional a, a PRC and DPRK relations does not seem to work uh, that very well. And Russia and China uh, try to cooperate as strategic uh, interest, but uh, their a fundamental view toward the global order and the regional order seems to be some uh, deviant with each other. Korea a concern uh, on security relations with China and Russia and North Korea. But when you look at market and free trade relations, it seems to be working very well with a socialist regimes or collective authoritarian a dominant countries. So in that sense, I think we have to sometimes differentiate commercial cooperation from security relations with these non-liberal democratic countries, quote-unquote. Let's talk about America just a little bit. There's been a lot of talk about China and obviously Korea because here we are. Is the U.S. going to go somewhere else? It's pivoted back here. It's not going to pivot away again. Is it going to pivot? On balance, I'm very optimistic about the trajectory of the United States. I think we have ample problems in the short run. The sense that the United States is somehow pulling back from the world and uh, is in the period of decline is vastly overstated. Um, there's a certain fatigue that has to do with having been involved in two wars over a period of a decade. We're still living with the after effects of the Great Recession. We have these budget problems that I referred to. Uh, but they're not, in my view, profound, fundamental, uh, terminal weaknesses. Um, so I think in the long run, the United States is going to be fine. But we have to get through a period when we are going to be perceived to be uh, relatively weak and preoccupied, and that's dangerous, I think, particularly in this part of the world. Whether the U.S. will uh, sustain its uh, staying power or not, that's not the question, but the, the tidal wave at the moment is uh, the rise of China, and uh, the number of people who can make a living sense to China is uh, greater than the you know, number of people who can make a living sense to the United States. This is an important question, you know, we have to take a look at. But uh, for the time being, uh, Chinese power uh, will have a, a substantial impact upon the neighboring countries as well as in the world, you know. That's why I raised the question, how can we resist, you know, to Chinese pool? The question uh, Korea, South Korea is facing vis-a-vis -vis North Korea is that whether we have to, you know, turn the North Korea into a sort of a, uh, our style country, a democratic country, or we have to uh, we have to take a policy that forces the North Korea into a position that we can live with. You now this is a serious conflict uh, uh, within Korean society. We we have a vision for the ultimate direction, but we have to be pragmatic about the path. Uh, this is a very badly damaged country. There's no way that overnight it's going to be a, a flourishing, robust democracy. I'm, I'm very careful not to use the word democracy because I, to me the most important thing is rule of law. It's having a system of predictability where my rights are protected by a system that I can understand. That's what the liberal international order is. So I think it, when it comes to North Korea, this is going to be a long and difficult process. Uh, it, can't, it can't be just South Korea's burden to bear. Uh, the rest of us have to be a participant to its solution. But ultimately, I have no, no doubt in my mind it's going to happen.
So I'm going to ask just, just in a very informal way for a show of hands for a couple of questions. How many of you are optimistic about Korea's future as opposed to worried? Optimistic. How many of you are optimistic about Korea's future? How many of you are worried about Korea's future? Almost half and half here. That's interesting. How many of you think that Korea is uncertain about itself? Okay. Uh, Dr. Hong, I want you to give your reaction to what you just saw. You know, we've uh, last 40 some years, I think uh, we've uh, accomplished quite a bit. Uh, as you pointed out, that we accomplished both democracy in every sense, uh, with some overdose of uh, freedom of expression. Even compared with uh, Japan, I, I'm very proud that uh, we achieved a uh, higher level of democracy. And at the same time, uh, we've achieved uh, quite uh, impressive level of industrialization. Firms, uh, you know, uh, enjoying uh, global brand power. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think uh, we are uh, facing uh, enormous challenges on our economic front. Uh, the, those young men and women are facing difficult uh, challenges in getting decent jobs. In my generation and generation behind us, we're not enjoying high standard of living as, as young generations uh, do now. But we didn't worry about getting a job, you know. We, we, we get recruited by various companies, you know. So job security is not there. Uh, they're better qualified than, uh, than our generations, but uh, getting decent jobs is not an easy thing. So uh, planning their future is not an uh, easy thing, you know. So we, that's why they, they portraying themselves facing uncertain future. Let me now ask a little harder question. How many of you think that China wants to see a unified Korea? The rest of you, do you feel that China would rather see Korea divided? Raise your hand. Uh, how many of you think Japan wants to see Korea unified? How many of you think then Japan wants to see Korea divided? This is interesting. How many of you think America wants to see Korea divided? Uh-huh. There are a few. There are a few. I think that's... How many of you think America wants to see a unified Korea? You are right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we have to pay attention to those of you that question it. Now, uh, one of my colleagues over here was going to pose a question. As we all know, DPRK is a buffer state locked between China and the U.S. In my opinion, China would never allow a unified Korea because they need buffer state. That would be possible only when China has a complete upper hand, in, our, in other words, a complete hegemony in Northeast Asia or lose its also influence in Northeast Asia. Are you implying that China's political position will be changed next 70 years? From uh, numerous second track dialogues with Chinese scholars, that it is in some ways uh, a litmus test or a, or a way to understand how the Chinese think about themselves. And for Chinese who are insecure about the strength of the Chinese Communist Party and think that that is um, the only way to secure China, uh, I find they are much more nervous about unification because they want that buffer state. The idea of a unified democratic Korea on their border is a very powerful magnet uh, within China itself. Other Chinese scholars who are not so wedded to the current system, uh, you can tell um, they're much more open to the idea that it's in China's long-term interests to have unification. And I think the reason that many Chinese want to keep the peninsula divided is, is ideological. It's what it would mean to have a democratically unified state so successful right on its border. The impact of Korean unifi unification upon China in terms of pluses and minuses, I think a plus effects include, for example, if unification happens, China will no longer 
uh, provide uh, economic assistance to North Korea. On the other hand, China is likely to lose uh, North Korea as a buffer state. China, even at this moment, must be weighing these uh, pluses and minuses of the impact upon unification. That means we have to uh, convey a kind of a plausible message to China so that China may think there will be more pluses than minuses. Why still Korea is not unified is because of lack of commitment, lack of commitment of the United States, I think. America's role was so below than our expectations. Well, I mean, we're not that powerful. <laughs> I think um, we have the um, military capability to um, affect unification. But the, the risk would be so enormous, and the greatest risk would be the people of the Republic of Korea. And so that's why I think the U.S. has not been able to use its power um, and has not been uh, ready to put the peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula at risk. We are talking about the 우리가 통일은 최종 목표가 아니라고 봅니다. 하나의 최저 목표일 뿐입니다. 이 소통, 북한과의 소통, 경제 협력을 소통 이것이 가장 중요하다 이렇게 보고 있습니다. I think you made a very interesting conclusion to our conference. Thanks our panelists for everything you did and let's just say warm applause for all of us. Okay? Thank you.